that the room got quiet and knew what was happening. Um, it's nice to see you all here. It's nice to see, okay, students just moved, so be careful. Um, it's nice to see a, a, a pretty packed house. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for trying to get through Artisphere. I know the traffic was probably a little uh, rough out there. Um, so, tonight, this afternoon, you're gonna hear from our junior students. You'll hear from 14 readers. We are so excited about these writers. They, you've heard them in December, okay? They've now taken more classes. They took another fiction class. They took another, po they're taking another poetry class right now and they are growing tremendously. Um, we are so excited to hear you, uh, to hear them read. We're so excited that you get to hear them read. Um, the, the, like I said in December, the thing that's so hard to see is how, how much they've worked on these pieces, how much has gone into them. Um, in my flash fiction class, people were asked to write three stories, and many of them wrote more than three stories, and more than four stories, and more than five stories, and they're really hard workers, and you're gonna hear that pay off tonight. Um, we're so excited to have them uh, read for us. Sarai's gonna lead us off. Um, don't forget to introduce yourselves, readers. Tell people who you are. Um, and Sarai will declare everyone. Carolina. I'm from Greenville and I'll be reading a flash 
exhibition piece called Crossing the Expanse. Part one, news. The first time Vijay will see her uncle Pragnesh is at his funeral. He died alone of heart failure in a hotel bed while orange juice soaked his underwear. When her dad, Prasoon, heard the news from his mother, after a few seconds, he said into the phone, that's the leading cause of death in the United States and the world. Prasoon is in charge of arranging the funeral, only out of love for his old mother and guilt for what he had first said to her about his estranged brother's death. The only condition Vijay set, Vijay's grandmother set for the funeral is for it to be in Scottsdale, Arizona, where she knew Pragnish would have to spend his weekends at their turquoise spas. But what she and Vijay don't know, what everyone else in their family knows, is that Pragnish only went to splurge at the biggest casino in Arizona. For flowers, she wants for soon to buy the prettiest and most popular kind in the state, whatever it is. Part two, funeral. The cemetery is two miles away from the hotel slash casino where Pragnish died and across the road from an IHOP. The cemetery manager can only give them a corner plot because the two available ones more toward the middle of the field are reserved by families who expect their death soon. The day is mostly stagnant and sunny, disrupted only by the wind caused by the cars in the morning rush hour. Why haven't I met him before, Mom? Vijay asks, holding her hand up to block the sun, to see Uncle Pragnish's enlarged passport photo beside his casket with yellow poppies on top. Arizona state flower, the white blossom of a saguaro cactus was not feasible. Because he's always kept it himself, her mom says, rubbing her hands in her lap, turning back in her seat to find her soon. Her soon is standing on the curb of the parking lot with his hands dug into his pockets. He's talking to his older brother, who Vijay had met only once at her grandmother's 81st birthday party. He came a little drunk, but nobody could tell until he helped his mother blow out her candles. Then Prasoon pulled him outside, and the party pretty much ended. Vijay watches him now, waiting for a cheek kiss to happen, at least a hug, but he must be too old for that. Part 3, Reception. Vijay's grandmother is serving everyone bowls of green moon dal taka with paratha, and there will not be dessert. Not even a honey mango, which Vijay craves after a hot day. Instead, her grandmother gives her a plum that's bruised, and she thinks this is to punish for spoilments because the grandmother gave her a look. As most of the extended family leave, Vijay's mother stoops the kitchen while the uncle watches a soccer game on his iPad with two other men Vijay doesn't know. After she brings all the dirty dishes to her grandmother at the sink, she goes to see her dad, who's inside the hallway coat closet. He sunched over an old wooden box with stickers of Flintstones, Mickey Mouse, Snow White, and Popeye. Inside are black tattered cleats with grubby green laces, father size. I'm sorry about your brother, Dad. What are you sorry for? You didn't know him, he says, closing the box and putting it back on the shelf. Part four, flight home. The flight is only two hours and a little turbulent every 20 minutes when Vidya grips the chair arm. For soon next to her, lays back his head and closes his eyes, his lids switch. For a minute, Vijay thinks he's praying, but she's not sure. His hands stay composed on top of a book in his lap, which is never open, and they don't move. His back is flat against the seat, which makes it easier for Vijay to look out the window past him without worrying whether he'll think she's staring. They're flying over the Sonoran Desert now. From 35,000 feet above, it just looks like an expanse of sand, an alternate sky with wispy shrubs for clouds. Vijay leans back in her seat, trying to figure out what she should do or say to him. When she asked her mom after the reception, when they got a chance to be alone, she told her to just be there and it'll be enough. So Vijay folds her hands in her lap and decides to just stare. She thinks if he tries to sit like him, then she can know what's on his mind. Or maybe she can sense what he really feels. Exhaustion? Sadness? She feels sad, but it's more about her father than his brother. She imagines if she had a brother who died, she'd want someone to hug her, hold her hand, she wants to know what her father wants, what he's feeling. She wonders if he feels anything at all. Maybe he doesn't even know. Then Vidya reaches across her seat and puts her hand on top of his. Thank you. My name is Meredith Spiker, I'm from Greenville, and I'm going to be reading poetry today. And for context for this first poem, the word chaos, as in like what existed before Earth in classical mythology, means the same as the word gap or to close my story. Gap, part one. My mother shoves another pair of jeans under the changing room door. The walls are white in this gap, and the mirrors I can see much more than the expanse of denim swathing my legs 
I can see the places where my skin dips and tugs, the scars tripping and splotches spreading, the old remnants from falls taken. These ones look long enough, but they may be too tight. Two, primordial soup existed before anything else, swirling and swelling, filling everything, taking up nothing, before everything coalesced into something, into Gaia, into Earth, before it plunged into crevices and canyons, rivers and roads, the highway we took to get here, to this gap, it was chaos, space and stars, no boundaries, only limits, could do so much but so little. Not really alive, not really dead, it was chaos and it means the gap. It couldn't do anything, didn't like its form, so it became Earth. Three, the white walls are stars now and I don't exist. I can do so much but so little and I hate myself for it. I'm not there in the mirror. My limbs are gone and too present. My body is the floor and the walls and the air, but I don't breathe. Try these on. Four, the jeans are the right length but too tight. When I touch my finger to the mirror to see if it's real, the tip doesn't meet the other and I feel safe, alone, at least in this tight stall just where I need to be. My mother wants to buy a jacket. It's Sherpa, she says from outside the changing room, where she needs to be for me when I come back home to Earth. I tell her to go for it. Uh, the second poem is called Too Much is a Good Thing. Dear blue walls, I don't know why they left the ceilings the same ostrich egg beige that lies beneath you, but I'm glad they did, because if they didn't, there'd be a blue cage from all sides. I used to love this room, used it like a pain relief, but now, when I'm the servant of the glowing square in front of me, it's somewhere I cannot stand to be. Too much of a good thing is when you cannot leave. The air is thick here, the smell from the candles making my brain churn to the front of my skull and surge against it. The lid is filled with half-burnt matches. The gray flakes of them are staining the tin, and when I touch my finger to them, it could be Ash Wednesday, when soot rained from my brow into my eyelashes and the world was a little bit darker. The carapace of a suitcase has clothes inching out like tentacles on the ocean floor. It's been there for five days, and I think it's decided enough is enough. Open but still packed, awake, with the coffin open for one last prying look. My eyes are joining my brain now, feeling like they've outsized their sockets, straining against them in a way that's uncomfortable to have them open or close, like a casket. The origami flowers are wilting on my walls, losing the forced integrity that I pressed into them with anger on nights in ninth grade until my bones creaked with the control and popped in protest until I buzzed with accomplishment and felt better in the way that comes with forcing your will onto something else and seeing it listen, or maybe just creating. I've been here for too long. Sunlit shapes from the windows mark the time, and the moon ornament leers at me from the handle of my door, as if to say, you're not going to sleep tonight, you know it too. My spine wants to rip out of my back, drop out of me and make for the door, dragging its bone cage with it like a child's blanket, searching for someone who would actually use it. Thank you. close to the water treatment plant with my mom and always have. This all happened about a year ago, in the summer. On one hand, I had been given a good brain and had read lots of books and felt thankful when the sun came out and shot the leaves through with light. And my mom and I liked to joke about that the smell of the water treatment plant had woven into our hair. On the other hand, her job at the mine ended at six, but most nights she didn't come home until after midnight. I liked my mom. She constantly changed prescriptions for drugs that were supposed to bring her close to reality. There was no reason not to like her. If I followed her out into the porch to smoke, we might have a conversation like this. Me. Treatment plant smells especially ass today. Her. Yeah. And she'd nod, gazing in that direction. The plant looked a little like the Rocky Mountains if you squinted. Sometimes I thought I lacked the imagination necessary to make life good, though my elementary school teachers always sent my mom letters that said otherwise. Sometimes the best part of my day was standing in front of the refrigerator and eating a slice of American cheese. We didn't own a TV or computer, which is how I figured most other people sorted out these discrepancies, by seeing what other other people did. 
I was two years out of high school and finding it more difficult than it should have been to leave the house, seeing mostly just my mom and the people who walked through the lobby of the Super 8 where I worked nights. The late night crowd was mostly drunks and methy kids I knew from school that had, and had been polite to. They were easy to deal with. They flunked down on the, stair, on the chairs with the orange cushions or garbled until I pointed for the bathroom. But every now and then we got a different kind of patron in the lobby, like a young couple or someone my age, a girl. She said she'd been driving all night and that her feet hurt. I was quiet, reading her room up on the computer. When I looked up, it was like her face had sunk inward. She was watching her feet and playing with the bottom button on her shirt, like she couldn't have looked me in the eye if she tried. I was sweating. I tried not to let it bother me, since I didn't know why it would. I kept my back to the counter for the rest of the night, smoking and throwing ash onto the carpet, laughing at things that weren't funny. One morning after my shift, I walked into the back porch, with, and the guy who lived with his mom next door was also on his porch, smoking a big blunt. We had gone to school together. I hadn't noticed him much before, but as the minutes passed, when we were both on our porches, it seemed like I should do something. Hey, I said, can I come over there? He shrugged, sure. I climbed over the saggy chain link, link fence. We must have both sat on many times throughout our childhoods, though never at times that converged. It was muggy, and, my, and the Super 8 polo stuck to my back. The sky was crammed with clouds. It's like I was watching myself from above, at once intrigued and disgusted by what might happen. He offered me a hit of the blunt, and I declined. You don't smoke, he said. I don't see a point. I'm not sure what it would do to me. I wish he had said something more interesting, something that would have spurned better witticism. You'll kill yourself thinking like that, he said. I laughed, and he seemed to like that I'd laugh and laugh too. He bobbed his head and smiled for three seconds. I counted. At that, I climbed back over the fence feeling accomplished. I had a migraine for the next 24 hours, my pulse drumming in my temples. And when there wasn't anyone in the lobby, I leaned against the counter and let my eyes flutter. The way I saw it, I had embarked on a journey of microscopic moves. If I hadn't walked onto the porch at that exact moment, he might have already put the blunt out against the railing and gone inside by the time I got out there. If I hadn't said something, he might have turned his face away to pretend I wasn't there. If I hadn't turned down the hit, he wouldn't have made the comment about me killing myself, and I wouldn't have laughed, which I'd read somewhere it was the fastest way to form a connection with someone. Thank you. Thank you. 
Council, and I'm from Cleveland, South Carolina. And uh, today I'm gonna be reading my poem, They Don't Call It a Tragedy for Nothing. I'm the cat that stayed in the bag. I'm the miscommunication that refuses to come out in a cheesy romance movie. Justine and August will never stop talking for a week before making up. They will continue to grow closer but keep that shallow, only an hour into the movie kind of relationship. Justine will continue to think that she isn't good enough to date August. Justine will never tell him that she loves collecting rocks and getting muddy while catfish fishing. August will continue to be afraid to show his true feelings to Justine. He won't tell her that he gets scared during movies like Annie and that he's flustered and that he's flustered when she talks to him in the hallway at school. They will stay this way, exchanging kind words and making advances on another, but neither of them will go further. The climax won't hit and the movie won't continue. I can't break my, bring myself to break them up only for them to come back together. I'm the secret that's never revealed in a family on in a family on a TV drama. The secret rendezvous the father makes with the daughter of Carly's teacher won't become known. The mother Sharon will never find out and sh her trust won't be shattered. Sharon will continue to go on long motorcycle long rides with the father into the countryside. Sharon will still ride a motorcycle and he will cling to her waist as they fly down the road. Carly will continue to look at her teacher the same way every day, never thinking about how the teacher ruined her family. Carly will continue to look up to her teacher during recess and they will continue to talk about manga like Full Metal Alchemist and Berserk. The father will come home late every day and Sharon will think nothing of it. She will massage his shoulders the same way while asking about his day. Carly will only ever think about her father being the man who took her to daddy-daughter dances and volleyball games. I refuse to make everything that was once fine suddenly become a mad shot. I'm the cat that stayed in the bag. Everything stops and nothing can move forward. I'm scared of losing everything I have. I'm scared that Justine and August will become a gross couple doing PDA, but they won't awkwardly approach each other while smiling ear to ear. I'm scared that the family won't be a family anymore, that the normal life they once knew will be gone and nothing will be ever be whole again. I'm scared that the joke won't be funny, that the audience won't laugh and instead be pushed back in disgust. I'm the cat that stayed in the bag, so if I leave my bag, everything in a split second will change. Nothing can ever stay the same, and that terrifies me. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Gagne. I'm from Simpsonville, South Carolina, and today I'll be reading two poems. The first one is called, Are You Sorry That I Snapped? Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. In the distance or lack thereof, the sun dips below a rigid horizon, casting its last acts of defiance as streaks of ruddy orange across the south of blue sky. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. My father and I have not spoken in 10 minutes, but we tap our fingers on the dashboard to the music that crackles from his God knows how old car radio. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. My little finger steadies my phone to take a photo of the colors as they swim closer in the side view mirror. Why must I capture this specific moment in time? This moment only exists to me, and I'm the only one who will see this exact view that I see now. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. I imagine a camera that snaps a photo of us now. My lips drawn tightly together in silence, my father's brow furrowed, and his nervous eyes glancing between his kid and the road. My second poem is called, We Meet Again in Our Dreams. When we meet again, I touch you in your gently tanned skin under the cover of clouds dripping with sugar, and the smell of honey that drifts from your parted lips and greet me. With your arms outstretched, and I can't help but to be pulled into them, my every breath echoing the expanse of hazy pink trees where the lazy sun dips in your ardent searching kiss. Camellia petals drift by us with the breeze. You brought me flowers? Oh, how sweet. You reach into my soul and you echo in my mind, full of empty space. My thoughts float around us, muffled by your voice and your winsome eyes and your lingering touch. Thank you. she runs out of peeling arrangements. This time, the chaise lounge of the sectional is separated from the rest of the couch and pushed up against the wall with the television hung on it. She has insisted on appearing confident in her decision. 
She makes a point to sit on it, her body just below the television. If she were to watch anything, her neck would be tilted almost entirely upwards, like she is praying to something hidden behind the TV. The home reminds me of my grandparents' living room during those days leading up to my grandfather's passing. His infant care bed lying directly in the middle of the living room, a tray table beside it scattered with pill bottles and crumpled metal foils of eaten Hershey kisses. Quickly, the main area of their home became an end-of-life care center. The only sounds, the landscapers outside, Fox News, and his labored breathing. My mother explained to me that this was better than dying in the hospital. It is far more peaceful to go in your own home, ideally when you are asleep. After her redecorating is finished, my mother invites my brother Nolan and I to the living room with her. She is sitting on the isolated lounge, the dog panting at her feet, recovering from his walk. My brother waits to be spoken to, killing time by lifting his vape to his mouth every few seconds. He exhales and the clouds float upwards, dense and distinctly fruity. For a few moments after the exhale, the living room is filled with thick pillows of pollutant, tepid white clouds rising and melting into thin air. Before my grandfather passed, I thought, surely Nolan will say something now. I knew his habit of speaking minimally. I remember looking over at him, his legs crossed so that his ankle rested on his knee. He twisted and turned the metallic vape in his hand, pretending to inspect it to avoid looking at the dying man. I expected Nolan to tell our grandfather that he loved him, even if he did not want to, or even if he did not mean it. It is what I had said. The air of the living room was thick and smelled like dying people. I'd like to think that Nolan noticed this too, the smell of the end, and that each time he brought his vape to his mouth, it was an attempt to mask the smell and the feelings that come with it. When it finally happened, after a week of my grandfather lying still and unresponsive like he was already dead, our family members huddled in my grandparents' home and remained mostly silent. We did not call hospice until after we were sure that he was dead, though we had no machines to signal us. You know death when you see it. Fogged eyes, limp fingers, Veins fading from black to blue to gray, breath interrupted by short stifled gasps turning entirely into silence. We drove home for dinner that night, and in the car Nolan finally spoke up as we passed through Bedford, the rocks of the dirt clinking around the tires like coins in pockets. I guess you could say their living room was also a dying room. What followed was only a few, few sharp sighs from the front two seats of the car. In her own living room, my mother laughs at the dog, who is doing nothing, and I am not sure if she is drunk or trying to prove a point. She asks Nolan about work, and he responds with one word. She asks me to put on the Sebastian stand-up special, and I tell her that we have already seen it a dozen times. She throws her hands up to show that she has given up on making an effort to entertain us, and returns her attention back to the dog. Why don't you speak? She asks Nolan. He looks up at her, his eyebrows slightly furrowed in the middle of his forehead. He returns his gaze back to the device in his lap. You'd be a nice person to come home to if you spoke, she said. This annoys him, but she does not stop. She gets up and walks towards the two of us, her hand out in front of her. Can I hit that, she asks. He hands her the vape, and she looks at it with fake confusion. She's done this close to ten times before, but likes to pretend that it is her first time every time. She brings it to her lips, inhales, and coughs when it reaches her lungs. You're very smart, she says to Nolan. I can't tell whether or not it is my fault that you are like this. She laps around the living room, finds the radio in the corner, and presses the play button in hopes that there's a cue of music. Her station is on, and she dances disturbingly, crouching down to kiss the dog on the lounge. She does not know the lyrics, but her head is moving with the music anyway, her hands twirling at the wrists and floating through the air. I want to tell her to stop, but I can't move my eyes away. I watch her snake dance until I become unsure of what exactly I am seeing. Nolan goes back to his bed. My mother falls asleep on her special lounge in her special corner of the living room. On that bed-like chair placed in the middle of the living room, she looks like my grandfather, her chest rising and falling with each passing moment, everything quiet and still. Thank you. Red hooded coal burns, lost, kindness, 
a golden glass that is never in time to stop the next exchange. Without it, this earthly parasite travels through our body. The second one is called breathing under blankets. My lungs are fingers seeking out the braille, words in order to read while buried under the 800 thread count cotton pillow, trying desperately to pull meaning from the clipped grooves of raised dots, jointed flesh, and nails clawing across and hesitating on friction. Fingers weaving through the oxygen, only to reach out again to press into pebbled words hard enough to create indents proportional to the temples for the blind. Trying to breathe is like this, dragging these words into flesh, dragging these fingers into my lungs. The last one is called a collage of fireworks. Cardboard box colored footstools and matchstick words wearing down to the tips of fingers and tongues too loud for a child's ears. Fire refuses lit before the lighter could run far enough away. Tie-dye burst too close to the ground. One of the arguments, the specific time, prolonged shifts or the exhaustion of dealing with a child. Remember creeping in the living room, hiding from them like spiders scurried from early morning newspapers, believing as a child they never saw. A stealthy spider who only left the remnants of webs as evidence they saw. Too many arguments, too close fireworks, ducking behind rubbed and furnished bark dusted furniture, needing to know why so many loud things like the TV turned on at full volume in the early morning. Waving hands and not the kind that say hello, being led back to the bedroom, diluting the need to question why, living in an apartment near the pond in Willow Tree Park, packing up bags every single weekend, spending them in a huge but partially hollow house, an egg with a crack that let out some of the yolk. That house where the father lives in the basement with the same amount of fireworks even now. Fireworks that help not to question the relief at the apartment, the relief at hiding behind charcoal couches only because it was fun. Thank you. an amber glow onto your face. You're enraptured by the events taking place on the screen, hidden by blankets pinned between your blonde waves and the wall behind you. You hate your hair, hair that rejects two in one, hair that refuses to lay flat. You hate its length, its lack of color. You're vocal about your hatred, Toward your dirty blonde locks that fall just above the small of your back, more vocal than I was with my own hatred for my mud brown mess. I fought tooth and nail to get a single strip of green dye in my hair hidden underneath the rest of the dark brown sludge I got from my dad. Mama didn't want me to destroy my hair, doesn't want it to be as dry as the hay we used to line the goat cages. But you got a myriad of purple, greens, and blues in your hair. Your hair looked like one of Mama's sequin tablecloths in the back of the minivan. When you were little, you would shake the tablecloth around to make stars and rainbow light fragments dance. You never had to wait. When you were little, I invited you to watch shows with me. When you first got your phone, you shared with our little sister that I still didn't have one. We both love horror movies and video games, and we both love each other, even though I call you a copycat for liking Tim Burton movies right after I said his movies were my favorite, which I won't apologize for. <laughs> I do things to protect you, so please be grateful when I drink half of your chocolate milk. Be because it could have been poison. Yes, I know it wasn't, but it could have been. Because I'm not dead, that's, what, do you want me to give it back? <laughs> or when I sat on your bed with you, plush blue comforter sticking to my legs, helping you complete overdue math assignments before the school called mama. I think about these things whenever I'm around you. I forget that great minds think alike in a fruitless search to rise above my own Icarus high goals. <coughs> 
I tried to leave you behind in a series of shut doors, hoods being lifted and earbuds being bought. I look and see the person you've become. You've worked hard to get where you are. I remember how excited you were to show your friends your new earrings. Freshly pierced right after I got mine pierced. The piercings I call hard to have, just like the hair. Yes, I'm still jealous that you didn't have to be the trailblazer. And yes, I will still slip you earrings through the bank slot between the headrest and the seat. Earrings that I wanted to wear, but by God, you need fashion more than I do. Thank you. Marge, you want to be sad, honey? Be sad. 
We'll write it out with you. Lisa is comforted by Marge. She smiles a genuine smile. There are two to three minutes left in the episode. Marge interrupts Homer and Bart's punch out to announce that Lisa recovered and is happy again. Fade out. The credits rolled over my TV. I was in sixth grade. I tried to smile a genuine smile. Two to three minutes passed. The credits did not roll. It didn't work. The second poem is called A Collection of Mistakes Observed from a Bird's Eye View. In a small house, a young girl sits and plays Legos, building a Lego Death Star for the sentient Emperor Palpatine minifigure in her left pocket so that he will stay magic and alive and will be her friend. Outside the house, on a hill up the street, old man Sisyphus pushes his same old rock up the same old hill. If he lets go, that boulder would roll past him and crush his old lady, sitting in a rocking chair, and wait. He might make it this time. Up in heaven, God does not want Jesus to go off to college on Mars. He looks at his weather machine. His finger hovers over the hurricane button. He wants chaos, but he really shouldn't press it. He knows that. He presses it. <laughs> I hear angels sigh in frustration. Jesus considers more and more leaving for college and updates the sign. Zero days since disaster. I watch poor Sisyphus, not knowing about the hurricane winds that blow against him, wrestling the boulder out of his hands. It rolls down the hill and chases his wife like she's Indiana Jones. She just barely escapes. The boulder keeps going and going into the young girl's house. It demolished the Lego Death Star like it was a bowling pin, all 4,000 pieces. The young girl cried. But shortly after, the young girl started rebuilding. Sisyphus rolled his boulder out of the young girl's house and apologized profusely to his old lady before going back to his hill. God sat down in the weather machine's throne, assuring Jesus it wouldn't happen again. Behind all of them were foremen in dark red robes and whips that cracked like imminent abandonment. That's why the young girl, Sisyphus, and God all try to get Hi, um, my name is Savannah Bell, and I'm from Belton, and I'm going to be reading two pieces of poetry. Um, this first one is a praise poem to Hollywood's depiction of Italy and wanting what you can't have. It's called An Ode to the Unattainable. I was never dragged underneath the water with you, exhalations of breath bubbling in the brick well. I never touched what was tanned and toned, the air between our shins, the pulse riding underneath your wrists, groggy breath like Garda's racing tide to prune my fingers in her death. To what extent is fiction more sincere than the truth? Bronson Italian bodies slick with sweat and brimming with baby oil, skate on the surface of skin stifled by tacky foundation. Blouses billow from khaki waistbands, sweat beads from under movie lights. And although your image was unreal, I loved you, deeply so, as if you yourself were the teal water surrounding my submerged pale skin, or a manifestation of the basilicas that the Madonna blessed a rosary hanging from a faithful neck, the lace brimming at the bridge of size, and the untouchable balcony which haunts with the morning capulet. I'm left stranded somewhere between you and the whitening apples, which were the thin skin draped over the heavy handed grip of tangibility. I stand at the edge of the Atlantic, Clara Sara's scales twined around, my, twined around my legs, resisting a current which leads me to what I've never known. This second is a narrative poem called Slaughterhouse Worker. He watched the heifer's glassy eyes glance over the scenic view of the plains of which she was raised while she waited to be slaughtered. She gazed through the gate into the pasture which held her babe. He saw the sweat-stained shirts of the men who grabbed the beast by the necks, muscles strained in the calves of the man who lifted the bolt gun to the pearlescent coat of the pacifistic cow. She trembled under his inevitable judgment the judgment of the men above him to be dealt with by those below him. He uttered a prayer as he smeared the gun between the eyes of the cow, as ash was once smudged on the oily skin of his forehead, as blood had slicked the apron he ripped off his shoulders. Before he opened his screen door, his skin was sticky and sweet with the smell of summer, 
his clothes soaked in the scent of manure. And as the cattle saw nothing after the day was done, he came home to the sight of static spinning from the television, to a check sealed on the kitchen counter next to his child, whose wife watched as he worked all day long. The wife whose husband enters their home, reeking of death for $10 an hour. The man who now lifts their child by the back of her fragile neck and rests on a towel so as not to dirty the bed, who lies skull to skin with his daughter and his dark overalls, eyes closed. Thank you. Thank you all so much.